Check, check. Yan. Mayroon pa dala. Check, check, check. Hey, hey, hey. One, two, three. Check, check, check. Sa kabila, direct. Check test. One, two, three. Check, check, check. Hey, 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 hey. Okay na tayo, Ojo. Meron? Ah, oh, yun lang, hindi ko alam. Sige. Wala. Sige, play mo kasi hindi naman lalabas yan. Hindi naman lalabas. Padala ka lang dito sa amin. looking at was... Good morning again, and uh, welcome to this first session uh, of the APN conference, uh, which is on the built environment, uh, which is specifically focused on urban resilience and climate smart cities. I was trying to reflect on the morning session that we had, uh, where you had these high level messages uh, from the people, and I think we need to get down to specifics and some practical steps today. And that's what I'm intending to do as a part of this session, to look at beyond the high-level messages, 
what can we do in, in our situations? And for that, I have a panel of speakers today. Correct, okay, now. Uh, the speakers range from project managers to practitioners representing think tanks for experience of projects, and of course, working with citizens and people on the oh. ground, that is even in form, informal settlements. And of course, all of them are going to focus on city resilience, how government, private sector, citizens together are dealing with this. In terms of the issues that uh, come to us uh, from this particular session are, uh, what we are really looking at is how is resilience going to be adopted in critical sectors as far as energy, transport, urban, water, and others are concerned, and what are the innovative technologies or even the indigenous technologies that we're using in this context. Uh, so the session uh, will start uh, with each of the uh, speakers coming in, having a 10 minute uh, presentation, either through slides or perhaps they want to just present their, their uh, topic. Uh, this will be uh, followed by uh, audience getting a chance to actually uh, have any clarification from the speakers. And then I hope, though we are starting quite late, I hope to leave ample time in the end for questions and a more interactive dialogue uh, from this session so that we can get a common set of outcomes and messages from this session that feed into the APN. Overall, this is one of the panel sessions and wow, we have actually got the big screen. So I was never hoping that, but this, that's, that's what we have got. So just to start with the actual session, uh, the first speaker that I have is Robert Wilby. Uh, he's a professor of hydroclimatic modeling in the Department of Geography at Loughborough University, UK. He was the contributing author to the 2017 UK Climate Change Risk Assessment. And I have known Rob earlier, of course, for his work on no regrets or low regrets adaptation. Today, he'll be talking about flood forecasting and knock casting for resilient uh, UK. And of course, that's been done in other cities also. So over to Rob. Uh, for his presentation, uh, 10 minutes, you have a timer there. Welcome, Rob. Good morning, everybody. It, it seems that whether or not we're in Metro Manila or Manchester, Bangalore or Birmingham, many of our glo global cities are confronting the, the significant challenge of surface water flooding. Now, in an ideal world, we dig up all the roads, replace the drainage systems, upgrade the infrastructure to contend with these uh, more extreme, more frequent storm events. But in reality, that's, that's not really an option to, to retrofit in such a way in many of the world's cities. So what I'm gonna be speaking about today is uh, some soft technologies that contribute to increase resilience through forecasting in very short time horizons, but at very high spatial resolutions, flood risk to support emergency responders. Now I'm standing here feeling a bit of a fraud because I've contributed a, a tiny fraction to the technical innovation and work that I'm going to present. Uh, most of that's been done by my colleague, Dapung Young, you. And uh, my role has been simply to cajole, challenge, and question the application of these tools. And I hope that that will come through in my presentation. So I'm going to just give you a quick outline of um, why these events matter, and then briefly outline what a now casting system is, how it works and how it can be implemented and scaled out and, and potentially applied to any global city where the available data uh, and, and modeling capabilities exist. So EU referendum day in the UK, two, thing, two bad things happened that day. And I'm going to talk about the second bad thing, which was the widespread flooding. Um, you can see here in the city of London, major issues around uh, 
underground stations, surface water flooding, to significant depths from a, a very intense downpour. And this is a scene that we, we recognize from all parts of the world. It's become more commonplace than we would like. And in the map, you can see the, the number of incidents to which the emergency responders uh, were called. Those shown in the, in the red dots are those responding directly to a, a flood-related incident. And you can see how many there were within that, that single day. Now, our emergency responders are mandated to arrive on scene for category one events within fixed times. So for an ambulance, that's seven minutes, and for uh, a fire and rescue service, that's eight minutes. And you can see from the table the fraction of uh, incidents where that target was not met on the referendum day. And you can also see from the scatter plot how many incidents missed the target. What we've got here is first-hand evidence of the impact of a, a, a downpour on the capability of emergency responders to arrive at the incident within their specified time. So it's a significant impact here on their ability to deliver their service. And in a changing climate in which we anticipate more intense, more frequent storms of this kind. We we have to approach a most uh, we have to approach this this task this challenge in a multifaceted way. It's going to involve a range of disciplines here. It's not just down to the technologists and the scientists. It's down to the the the, the planners. How can we focus on particular assets or parts of the city, so-called hotspots, and strengthen the resilience of those elements of the infrastructure? How can key service providers continue to meet their targets despite these changing conditions? And the scientists asking questions about how can we take this complex technology and communicate it to end users in forms that are intelligible and meet the needs of the decision maker, whether in an operational or a planning context. So our flood now casting system has three steps. Essentially, we're taking high resolution, intense rainfall forecasts from the UK Met Office system, which blends convection permitting rainfall simulation with radar data to give us forecasts at two kilometer resolution up to seven hours in advance starting now. So it's giving us that one to seven hour window forward to, to anticipate a, a, an extreme event. And we're taking that information, feeding it into our two dimensional flood model and then simulating flooding at the street level. And that's a critical feature of this system, it's street level simulation so we're able to anticipate exactly which parts of the urban fabric and network are likely to be disrupted. That information is then passed on to the UK uh, government's cabinet office. They have a, a platform called Resilience Direct which is used to distribute this information to emergency responders so they can react in a coordinated way with this advanced information. So here we can see um, an example simulation and you get a sense of the um, fine resolution that's possible with this type of technology. Now, of course, there is uncertainty attached to the forecast that when you're operating at this scale and the uncertainty grows the further you go into the, into the future. So one of the key technical challenges that we're still seeking to resolve is how convey that uncertainty to the end user, but still provide a usable product. The second application of this technology is for more strategic thinking. We can take information about transport networks, distribution of vulnerable people and property, such as hospitals and schools, and try to understand 
which parts of the, the network might not be reachable within a flood event, whether surface water flooding or from fluvial flooding. And we've just pre performed perhaps the first national assessment of this kind, where we've identified on a site-by-site -site basis those facilities which can't be met within the mandated time under given types of flooding conditions. And the figure on the bottom left-hand side shows um, in the, the comp by comparing the light and the darker blue, the areas, the service areas that shrink under a given flooding episode. And you end up identifying sites that can't be reached within, within a, a mandated time because of disruption to the transport network. And this enables us to then start to think about what the adaptation response might be. So contingency planning, forward placing of vehicles and this emergency responders in locations where they can serve these um, unreachable areas, or it helps us to identify those hot spots in an urban environment where we might focus attention on strengthening infrastructure or drainage in those particular areas. So uh, our next steps are to scale this up. Um, we already have the system running for four cities in the UK, 30 or 40 uh, cities worldwide. We're seeking um, to strengthen the ways in which we deliver the information on network disruption to decision makers and to complete the connection through the government's uh, Resilience Direct platform to create this seamless connection between the technology and the, the decision maker at the city and even at the street scale. So my final slide is really an, an open invitation to anyone in the audience who would like to participate in this endeavor. And essentially to set up a system of this kind requires the five ingredients that are listed on the screen there. And I think I feel I'm running out of time to, to work through each one of those, but essentially topographic information, knowledge of critical assets, an, uh, an understanding of the local flood risk and the priorities of the service providers. With that information, we have the potential to set this up in a city near you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for that presentation. Uh, as I said earlier, any quick clarifications, any comments that you have, we can have a question answer session later, but just any quick clarifications. Anyone from the audience wants any further information on that? He's already offered uh, these five steps uh, in working together. So perhaps we can uh, get in touch with him later at the session. But any quick reactions from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you for that question. I almost feel like I planted you in the audience to ask me that question because, yes, um, in fact, in a detailed study of uh, Shanghai, we have factored in the reality of subsidence, which obviously depresses parts of the city and causes water to collect in new places or in greater depths than it might have done in the past. We've also um, studied Bangkok in great detail in terms of fluvial flooding, surging, surface water flooding, subsidence, and climate change. So maybe we should talk afterwards. I think thanks for the intervention. I think a big hand to Rob uh, for his presentation. I think the message that I'm taking from this presentation is this whole critical period of one to six hours and how you can actually build in the forecasting element. Of course, you can look at cyclones, how do you track the cyclones and all that's being done. But what do you do about events, extreme events that are happening around, uh, especially the storm events that are happening, uh, cloud bursts that are happening more frequently and creating a lot of damage. And I think there is one option available in terms of looking at these technologies. 
Uh, reflecting back on what ADB is doing in this, uh, we have just sort of set up a similar flood forecasting early warning system in Kolkata. And uh, that even combines uh, sensors which actually capture heat stress, air pollution, and of course the flood water level data uh, into one sort of sensors and they are planting it all the cities. But the, what is critical and what came out from Rob's uh, presentation is how do you get the response mechanism activated? And that again brings us back to the issue of how you have better city, better city governance in terms of ensuring the use of these technologies. The other thing is how I think in this case, the government, the cabinet office, the academics, and the data has been organized to actually deliver services to the people. So those are two takeaways from my side, but of course you might have others. But what does happen? Of course, we have a question on Bangkok, but what happens when a similar thing is done in the Southeast Asian or the South Asian context? And that's what our next speaker is going to tell us. Uh, the next speaker uh, for this panel uh, is uh, going to be Jan Ramos Pandya uh, is a smart city and a digital government enthusiast. His mission is on how to make governments more responsive and effective in delivering their public service to the citizens. He's going to talk about flood data and the citizen interface in it and take a Southeast Asian context of change. So over to Jan for the next presentation. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please introduce my name is Ramos Pandya. I'm from Jakarta. Is anyone here from Jakarta? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, we would like to share with you uh, what is Clue has been doing in helping Jakarta city government to overcome various citizen problems. Clue was established in 2014, and we are started to work with the city government on 2015. So today, uh, we would like to share with you how our apps is being used by the city government and the Jakarta citizen in overcoming uh, actually not only flood, but uh, various uh, citizen problems that they can report from their neighborhood to the city government. And the platform enables the city government to respond uh, ASAP uh, to the reports. So uh, this is the picture of Jakarta in 2013. This is uh, considered one of the most, the worst flood in our history <laughs> uh, in 2013. So Jakarta is actually a very prone flood city because uh, we are located nearby the sea and also lay low to the sea. Uh, besides that, uh, during that time, we have a very ineffective uh, waste management. And also, we have a very bad flood canals. So in Jakarta, we have these two major flood canals. which uh, We call it uh, East Flood Canals and West Flood Canals. At that time, the flood canal is not, uh, it's not properly... Uh, use because many settlements are on the on the river basins. So our tech helps the city government to receive data from the citizen using our apps to report if they saw there is any potential flood spot within their neighborhood. So uh, this is how it works. And uh, we've been working now uh, three years with the S Jakarta city government. Uh, so. This is one of the statistics that we would like to show you, especially uh, in 2016, we received the highest uh, reports on potential flood reported by uh, Jakarta citizens uh, through our apps. Uh, more than 5,000 potential floods being reported. This is very important data for the city government because we use the citizen as our sensors of course, there, is, there are another sensors on the field, uh, like CCTV and some other sensors, you know. But we believe, and it is in our value, that citizen is the core of smart city. So we empower them to report if they're so, if there is any flood potentials within their neighborhood. So in 2016, there were 5,000 uh, reports. And the highest report was on February. So uh, as you see on the graphs in front of you, the red one is on the February. This is 
also related with climate change. Usually in Indonesia, we have heavy rainy season on, you know, on September and October until December. But uh, on February, we have a very heavy rain season. And this is aligned also with the report of Indonesian Agency for Climatology at that time. So we believe that citizens should participate actively in providing reports so government can take action. So here we uh, visualize, uh, based on our data, the spots of the flood potentials in 2016 and uh, on our life's data on 2018. What we see here is there's a massive uh, reduce of flood spots uh, between two years. Uh, what amazing is how the city government at that time used the data to do planning and budgeting in overcoming and mitigating uh, floods in the future, in the years to come. So at 2016, there were three major programs that initiated by the government uh, based on this data. First, uh, they, uh, they implement the program that we used to call it river normalization. I mentioned before to you about the two flood tunnels in Jakarta. So during that government administration, which is uh, Ahok's government, they really work hard in cleaning up the rivers from the settlements. So in order, it's, uh, it's being able for, it's a good waterway uh, to overcome floods. Second, there is a government regulation to initiate what we, we, are, we know knows as uh, Pasukan Orange or Orange Troops. The Orange Troops are the staff, the officers that are being hired to respond as quick as possible whenever citizens report problems. So the SLA, the service level, service level agreement at that time is two hours. So once someone submitted report within two hours, uh, someone from the neighborhood should respond, which is the officer that being uh, paid by the government. So, and the third one is they incorporated the data into the planning and budgeting process for the next year. And as a result, uh, in 2018, uh, in 2016, there were, there were 400 spots uh, being identified. And 2018, I think it's only uh, 80, 80 spots uh, for flood. So what is the key? Uh, we are in clue, strongly believe uh, that citizen as the main beneficiaries of public service should, should participate and fight for their uh, uh, right uh, to, to gain services from the government. It only happen if they also participate in providing data. So. Uh, up to today, we have more than uh, 1 million users with 700, 750,000 active users. Every day we receive uh, from 2,000 to 2,500 reports from uh, citizens of Jakarta. Clue is now also implementing in other cities uh, all over Indonesia. We were working with 12 cities in uh, implementing this program. So we believe in building city resilience, you know, in building uh, climate smart cities, citizens should be strongly involved, the government should take action, and both of these uh, parties should be facilitated through technology. We, we were in days, you know, when we have problems, we do not know where to report. We write letters, but we don't know uh, whether it will be responded or not. But through application, it's a real-time platform where citizen can report and the government can also take action through their uh, resources because the government is the one who has the resources. So it works very simple, like what you see here. You know, you open the apps, you take picture uh, on the problems that you want to report, and it comes with red, which, is, which means waiting, just being submitted. When the, your report is being responded and completed, it turns to green. And all the data is being analyzed and integrated into the city government dashboard. So they can take action, uh, create policy, planning and budgeting aligned with that. So these are some examples of and publication how our apps works in helping making Jakarta better in terms of flood and other problems.
uh, at one, uh, I think last year, one of the major uh, newspaper in Jakarta doing survey about the effectiveness of our apps, of the Clue apps, and most of the respondents agree that 61.4% is effective and it increased uh, government performance better. So this is our presentation for today. Uh, citizen is, should be in the core of the building city smart resilience. Thank you. I think that uh, was a very powerful presentation uh, showing how social media, the penetration of mobile phones, of course, we know that uh, Indonesia is really leading in this area and how it can be productively used. Of course, uh, one of the things in the two presentations I, I reflect back is we are seeing uh, a lot of the government uh, holding the data or actually funding the data acquisition. And then, of course, citizens providing an interface to that. Uh, we haven't really spoken much about uh, what happens when the private sector enters into the resilience area. And that's what the next presentation is going to cover. But before that, again, if you have any specific comment, any clarification from Jan, please let me know now. Anyone from the audience? Yes, please. Yeah, I'm Ryan from uh, Davao City, Philippines, from the Association of Pollution Control Officers in Mindanao. Uh, you said that it's a real time uh, based on the presentation, but how about if uh, uh, lines or internet connections uh, gone wrong? So how do we address it to have a timely and uh, uh, address the adverse impact? Thank you very much, Ryan. So uh, our algorithm, uh, the apps it was designed also to be uh, applicable when it's offline, means there's no connection. What the apps do is you can just take the picture and once you're online, it will automatically submit it your report. We implement this uh, a month ago in Lombok disaster, this uh, Lombok earthquake. We are working with the National Disaster Agency to map all the uh, buildings affected by the earthquakes. So the connection was very bad at that time, but people uh, take picture of it do, through our apps and once they are connected, uh, uh, they, the pictures, the data is auto automatically being submitted to the dashboard that we have created uh, with the National Disaster Agency. So that's how we approach it. Okay. Thank you very much. So we move on to the next speaker. Uh, as I said that, you know, moving beyond uh, looking at uh, greenfield cities, how city urban planning actually leads to smart, green, and resilient city. We have Teresa Young, who heads the East Asia region planning business of ARO and is the global master planning and urban design skill leader of ARO. So that's a big uh, challenge. She has experience formulating SGR, which is smart, green, and resilient city master plans at multiple scales. The specific example that she's going to cover is from Hong Kong. So over to Teresa. So um, good afternoon, um, everyone. So uh, actually, um, the example I'm going to talk about is um, a place in Hong Kong is um, over 200 hectares. It's in a Brownfield site. Um, the two formal speakers, they talked about the um, uh, the now forecasting and also the application um, on the, uh, forecasting the flooding. I think that's very relevant to what I'm going to talk about. But then, um, you know, that's like uh, during the implementation stage, we can apply all the forecasting and also the application uh, when we are implementing or doing the operation of the new town. Um, to me, um, it should start with the planning stage. Actually, uh, the challenge here is that we got an area of 200 hectare, but it is on a floodplain, which means that um, the future population is very vulnerable to any um, change in like um, the climate change or the flooding issue. And that's the reason why, as you can see from the screen here, if I can show to you this um, big 
actually um, the laser pointer doesn't really work on the screen. But anyways, as you can see from the like top um, uh, of the slide, you can see that there is a very strict uh, blue uh, corridor. That is a man-made nona. The reason why is that the Hong Kong government put in a lot of money in building the infrastructure to make sure this nona surface an uh, important drainage channel to receive all the rainwater rainfall from the like climate change um, issue. And therefore, this area currently is all right. It's not subject to any um, uh, flooding issue. But when we are putting in uh, more people, then we have to tackle um, this issue um, like uh, very uh, carefully. And, and okay. therefore, okay. we think that um, this area, although it's like currently, as you can see on this area photo, is brand new operation. They are full of open storages that makes the environment very degraded. Nevertheless, it is located in a rural environment with many ecological assets. How we can preserve the existing natural and ecological assets without um, like further degrading the environment, but we are very ambitious. When we are talking about adaptation and also resilience, it's not only a reactive approach, it's not just preservation. We are talking a more proactive approach, how we can enhance the ecological value, how we can increase the biodiversity. That's our main theme. And therefore, we have built in, um, in our planning, um, five uh, core value into our planning. And the most importantly, we adopt the smart green resilient approach. I'm going to tell, talk to you about like in the coming slides. Um, firstly, as you can see from here, that we are planning for a city for a population of 88,000 population, which is like huge population, which is equivalent to a, a city scale. How we can uh, put in so much population in just 200 hectare land? As you can see from this here, the master plan, we focus and then we uh, put all the development into like a concentrated into a compact space. The reason why is that we want to preserve um, all the natural asset and the natural environment impact and have it like further enhanced. And therefore, um, the development is quite high density on certain area when it is like more close to the, um, to the existing um, new town area. As you can see, the um, PowerPoint, uh, that's the, the annotated urban living area is like where we have the highest density because it is close to the existing new town. And then it's degrading downwards towards the south. The reason is simple because we do want the future residents to have more integration with the natural environment. By doing so, firstly, our first core value is to respect the natural environment, and this is a must. How we are going to adapt to the existing environment, first um, approach is to preserve the existing natural and rural resources. Not only that, we were very surprised um, when we are carrying out this study, we do full range public engagement we go out and talk to the existing community, adjoining villages, and also the general public of the whole Hong Kong. And then together, um, you know, Hong Kong is always like um, financial center, international city. We want development a lot, just like the Philippines, build, build, build. But surprisingly, um, when we go out and talk to the people, they ask us to keep and preserve the existing active farm net within the area, reason being, they do, or we do, want, really want to have a like, different lifestyle. We don't, uh, uh, we no longer want to just live in an urban jungle. We, work, we want urban farming, and therefore, um, one of those measures is to retain the active, existing active farmland, and also to provide urban farming um, um, area for the future residents, and as well as for the existing residents. For the existing residents, we keep them intact. We do not move them out. And then they can integrate into the future um, area. And for the birds, uh, for their home, we also retain the, the eco tree so that they, the birds don't need to move. Our second core value is um, to 
regenerate the natural environment. This is what I told you about. Um, it is the proactive approach. So we create and we retain and create through green infrastructure. By green, we mean the natural resources, the green environment. By blue is the natural stream and also the artificial man-made stream. And we adopt a eco-hydrologic uh, hydraulic approach. What means by eco-hydraulic approach is that we recycle and reuse all the rainwater that fall into the sites. And even the sewage system, we after tertiary treatment, we will be discharged into a wood bag to, uh, pool, to cleanse um, the pollutant. And then before discharging it back to the Nauna plus, we use it as fresh water. And, uh, and also water for irrigation purposes. So not a single drop of water will be wasted. So it is a re recycling uh, system. What's more is that um, the very important man made um, this slide um, on the top, we are going to take out all the concrete from the Nola and make it into a natural stream again. So a natural big river without compromising its um, function to absorb the um, flooding, as well as we increase the biodiversity there by uh, planting in a lot of um, uh, plant species. And of course, um, we had um, additional um, to bring the nature to the people because what we believe is only through education, through engagement by the community that this resilient city can be wholeheartedly implemented. And therefore, we bring the people to the nature to ask them to appreciate the nature and they will care and love their natural environment. And without the government doing a lot, they, that a resilient city and community will eventually happen. And of course, um, we care about the livability and resilience. We care about the environment, but we do also care about our people and therefore, we try to provide uh, as much local housing to them as possible and provide a very sustainable environment for them to live in. And as you can see here, when we are talking about resilience, it's not only climate or physical resilience, it's also about economic resilience. We provide job opportunities to the local community and also it's also about social resilience. We talk to the community, we create what they wanted to have as uh, in their community. This, throughout the whole planning process, we have um, three-stage public engagement. We went out for over 200 meetings with different stakeholders, religious, a general public, environmentalists, politicians, etc., etc., And we to make sure that the community we plan for is hand-to-hand -hand, and then together they are happy and then actually the government do not need much engagement. What we have here is that um, we have a plan that, as I can show you here, this is the product. Um, uh, it doesn't work well. Anyways, uh, yes, this is the product. So what we have here is that the government is setting up a platform, a guideline and a framework for everyone to plan like this, a re truly resilient city. Implementation is by the people. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. That was a really sort of uh, illuminating presentation. Of course, taking us back to the whole issue of city planning, urban planning, of course, in greenfield situation, but also showing how the expanding cities, again, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Pacific, most of these cities are having this urban uh, agglomerations that are actually expanding and how to actually embed them into the city and yet create this urban farming and integrate. I think the other point that picked up from that presentation is uh, what we call is, is ensuring that the nat nature is actually integrated within the planning stages. Now, of course, uh, we are doing a similar piece of work uh, through ADB uh, in the new Clark City in the Philippines where uh, there is work happening on reviewing the existing master plan to actually look at what can be done about a river that flows right through that city. And what we have come up with is creating room for the river, 
because that room was being actually covered by concrete or by built structures. So, so reducing, creating room for the river, looking at the climate change projections and integrating them. Of course, some people even say, how about creating room for the rain? And that's what was illustrated in the morning two presentations, because I think we are trying to constrict too much of the built environment, and that allows nature to actually take its place, given the nature of the extreme weather events that we are facing. The other thing that I picked up from this presentation is water-wise and uh, basin-connected cities. So again, people are saying that, you know, it's not just enough to look at the city uh, water structures, the supply of water supply within cities, but look at the basin as a whole, because a lot of your impacts that are coming from the basin are then impacting the built environment in the city. And, and that's the theme of the World Water Congress, where they were talking about basin-connected utilities as well as basin connected cities now of course the the challenge for us is how do we really uh, get this done in situations that are already locked in most of our cities are in environments where you're locked into a particular stage of infrastructure a particular type of infrastructure and how you do that and of course when you look at the impact of uh, shocks and stresses in the city impact of climate, it's much more on the poor and vulnerable communities. For them, planning is something alien. They just settle where they want to. And that's what I think our next speaker will be talking about. But again, before that, I would give you an opportunity to reflect back on what Teresa has presented before we really move to the next speaker. So anyone from the audience, any quick uh, clarifications, any comments on what Teresa has presented? None. I think that means we can move ahead with the next uh, presentation, the next speaker. Uh, and the next speaker is one of my colleagues, uh, Lara Arjan, uh, is a multilingual program management professional with over 20 years experience in program management, monitoring and evaluation. Uh, she's currently working in the Asian Development Bank as an urban development specialist. And what she is going to actually talk about is what happens in cities which have already locked in infrastructure. What happens with poor and vulnerable communities who don't actually subscribe to the standard planning building code regulations? And that's what she's going to talk about. Over to Lara Arjan. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, everybody. And good afternoon. Um, I don't have slides. I only have this picture. And the picture is Ibu Maria and Tristan. And these are people who inhabit a site we call Site Zero within the project we are implementing or planning to implement an ADB. So we've just been doing some of the, the work around this project and at the moment it's a proposal. So, um, I mean, we've seen presentations about the database we need to plan, and we've seen a presentation about policy. But how does policy get implemented? And even more, how does policy get implemented at a very, very um, basic level, at the smallest level within the community, at a sub-community level, if you want, as well? Um, Working as an urban planner for a, world, a, a long time, and I don't want to rain on your parade, but these, these decisions are made politically. You get a mayor who really wants to do nature-based solutions, and then you get one who doesn't want to do it at all. The plan sits on the shelf for 30 years. Not that it's going to happen to yours. I hope it works out. But this is reality, and this is the challenge that urban planners face all the time. And I was so frustrated that I came to ADB, so I don't know how this will work out. <laughs> so um, how do we actually build resilience and how do we implement nature-based solutions mainly for the most vulnerable? How do we take planning from this policy level to an implementation level to basically help Tristan have a brighter future? Because in within any community, the aging and the babies are the most vulnerable. So um, the idea of this project we are doing is how do we leverage ecosystem services 
in this area. And this is an area ADB is looking more and more to leverage in the ecosystem services, which are essentially a very good way to build up resilience and adaptation because we provide natural solutions to manage environmental anthropogenic impacts. So for instance, you would use um, a stream or a channel, you would use a wetland to treat water. So that is, people call them different things. So there's nature-based solutions, low impact design, uh, water sensitive approaches, ecosystem services, green solutions, but they're all, of the same family, basically. So evidence shows that part of an integrated approach of adaptation, it's a very, like, if you use ecosystem appro approaches as part of a large integrated system, it's a very good way of adaptation, but it's also low cost in comparison to the economic and social benefits and ecological benefits you can get on the long range. But you know what? For politicians and policymakers, they don't care about long range economic impact. They want it now, within their period, their election period, they, that's what they want. They can't tell people, well, you're going to see the benefits in 30 years. And that's one of our challenges, right? So despite these advances and despite evidence, at least scientific evidence, we're facing these challenges. A, there's lack of information on this. There's not much information on nature these based solutions being implemented in actual cities and real life scenarios. So that's a big challenge we face. We also have a lack of financial resources. Who would risk their money for something that they would see after they die? I don't think many people would. So that's also an issue. Many cities will not put the money down. And there's also institutional resistance. So a little anecdote, when I worked in the city of Edmonton, we really liked to do our great flood water drainage storage um, in sort of open areas. But our maintenance guys just refused to maintain it. They, why, would I, why would I maintain it? I don't want to maintain it. So there aren't a lot of, like there's not much, organizations, institutions are so silent especially cities, that your planners don't really talk to the engineers and the engineers don't talk to the planners unless you have a plan engineer who can talk to both. So that is part of the issue that municipalities are facing. And even more, municipalities in a developing, developing context where there's not much money to experiment with. So why are you telling me to experiment with this nature-based thing People want a drainage pipe. People want a wastewater treatment plant. Why would they want us to use the river, for instance? Oh, kids are gonna fall in the river and drown. Mosquitoes, like we have all these issues. So in order to face this, ADB has this, okay, yeah, we are a bank and we're a big, big group. But one of the advantages is that we have trust funds and we were able to get some money to pilot and have a little sandbox and to pilot an approach. So using funding from UCC RTF, I know these acronyms are so difficult and I cannot believe I actually said this without stuttering. We used the funding, external funding, and we collaborated with partners who are basically crazy enough to pilot this and we are proposing piloting a nature-based solution in an Indonesian city called Makassar. And that's within a site called Batua, which is a small informal settlement there. And the project will experiment, if you like, sort of rehabilitating this slum site, giving them wa water by harvesting, uh, by harvesting rainwater, giving them sanitation by using artificial wetlands because there's not much space. The issue with, the major issue with nature based is that needs much space. So we are experimenting with building artificial wetlands that can fit in their restricted space. And so do we have a constructed artificial wetland and then after the secondary treatment, the water would go 
into the channel and into the river. So um, I think we are, also, we are also going to try and reduce flooding in the area by building these flood walls around the community. And we will separate gray water. So um, the whole idea is we're going to try and enhance the resilience of this flood prone um, community by using very low technology, nature-based solutions, as opposed to your normal um, traditional trunk tube. Um, uh, trunk, sorry, trunk, um, trunk infrastructure. So that's where we are right now. Uh, it is still in the making. We have not implemented yet, but there has been extensive consultation with the community in terms of how to design this project. So the designs are ready. We're ready to implement hopefully very soon once it starts. But it's a very restricted pilot. And the idea is, is that after looking at this pilot, we are going to document the information. We're already working very closely with the local authorities and the municipality so that that information will be disseminated. And then this demonstration part uh, site will provide proof of concept, hopefully, to expand this more and maybe also hopefully streamline this approach into ADD operations. So I thank you all for your patience and thank you. Thank you, Lara. I think uh, that was a really inspiring. Uh, I know that uh, she's been really championing this uh, cause here. And I think uh, looking at uh, the way, you know, the bank is structured, it's really important that countries are still demanding basic infrastructure, which is networks, sanitation, sewerage systems, drainage systems. And of course, given the way the cities are expanding again in our region, it's going to be very difficult to actually cover all the basic infrastructure and then move on to nature-based approaches. So I think this has to be done simultaneously. So what she has mentioned is the revitalization of uh, informal settlements through water-based or nature-based design is something that needs to happen simultaneously as we look at networks such as sanitation or standard sewerage in expansion in these cities because of the, the, the tension that we face in terms of the expanding cities uh, and the populations, especially in the urban and the peri-urban areas. Uh, so again, I think uh, a lot of uh, fundamental issues were raised by Lara. So again, any any quick clarifications uh, that you want? Any comment on what uh, Lara has said? Or do you want to really have one-to-one -one after uh, this session with her? Because she has raised many fundamental questions and that requires. But again, it's open to the audience. I think, Lara, they're going to meet you after the, it seems, in the session, because they might have a lot of <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes, OK. Uh, that's uh, really good. So I think uh, we are just sort of moving to the last speaker uh, in this. Uh, you, you're finding an empty chair there, because we have used another methodology. Uh, it'll be a video presentation. And in this case, uh, the last speaker is uh, Dr. Juliet Mir is the Technical Director of Resilience Shift, a global initiative to catalyze resilience within and between critical infrastructure sectors. Juliet uh, will be participating as a digital speaker, so we'll have up the, I think what she's going to talk about is planning for failure, fragility, what happens, you know, you plan all this, the cities, you plan the flood response system, but how do you really start planning for failure, given the stress that a lot of our infrastructure built environment is now facing? You have to integrate failure, or what we call today is safe failure, or to ensure that there is backup and spare capacity in whatever we are doing. Because we don't know when the next event is happening, how soon, how frequent, because standards, conventional engineering standards around one is to 50 years, one is to 100 years, uh, projections that were made based on the weather and the climate are being challenged right now. If you look at the events around you, things are happening right in the first five years, 10 years. And that's what really is opening up a lot of questions. 
So over to the last speaker, which will be a video presentation, uh, Dr. Juliet Mia, and then we'll open it. Hello, everybody, and thank you very to... much for having me and allowing me to join this session remotely. Um, sharing some some work that we've done um, as Arab and are uh, looking at as part of the resilience shift a year or so ago in the UK. And the, the question that we were looking at was, um, in a, in a very sort of specific way, what, what's the impact of the digital transformation in terms of how infrastructure systems are planned, designed, delivered and operated on the resilience of those systems, which I think is a very, it's a very good, very specific question. And it's something we don't always think about, particularly when the, the benefits of the digital transformation are the focus and the fact that they deliver speed and efficiency and, and help with growth and productivity. So just to put a bit of context onto this, what, what do we mean by the digitally connected infrastructure system? It's a rather long-winded way of, of saying that all of our physical infrastructure now and increasingly so into the future is going to include network links, end users with their computers and devices, software, um, data from sensors and monitoring, as well as the humans that are, that are in that. So, so it's a physical infrastructure system but increasingly now has this layer of, of digital technology over the top of it. So one of the key findings of this work that we did, we were working with the National Infrastructure Commission in the UK, is that from, from a perspective of smart infrastructure, so, so using digital technologies to, to monitor um, infrastructure and to create sort of communication and feedback from that infrastructure, it has great potential, these technologies, to inform resilience, to inform decisions, because it's, it's always gathering information. We understand much more about the condition of our structures, about the, the sort of external hazards that might be affecting those structures, and the information is there to help us make decisions. So it's got a great potential benefit in terms of informing resilience. It can also, as, it's, as, a, as itself, smart infrastructure can create resilience. But one of the important messages um, from this work is this, these technologies, this existence of smart infrastructure also has the potential to cause fragility or to create a vulnerability. So there's many examples of how smart infrastructure can both inform and create resilience. So the, most of these are from a UK perspective. But anything from on our on our motorway network in the UK, we now use um, it's called smart motorway. So we can use all lane -like running. We have active traffic management to respond as and when um, events occur, which, which helps the helps the network to respond and recover very quickly from events. Um, the there's there's an image here of the fourth crossing in um, in Scotland, which is a, which is a key infrastructure crossing which has embedded sensors and monitoring in it so that we understand the weather, we understand the condition. And again, it creates that feedback loop to help manage that, that piece of critical infrastructure. We also, however, have many examples of smart infrastructure causing fragility. So these examples here, which, which we drew on, are not specifically about infrastructure, but they're very real examples. And it's, it's easy to imagine how these could impact on some of our critical infrastructure as well. So there was a case in 2017 for British Airways when they had an outage which cost them 150 million pounds related to the shutdown of their, of their IT system. There was an example also uh, January 2017 where one of the Amazon data centers went down. So suddenly everybody realized that the cloud where their information is stored is a real place and it can be affected by weather and, and it, becomes, it becomes very real. And one of the interesting things there was the, the number of different sectors in different industries that were actually storing their data in the same place. So un unexpected um, consequences of that. And again, a very, a very sort of well-known case in the UK was the WannaCry cyber attack, which cyber attack which caused major, major disruption across the entire NHS because they lost their um, software systems. It took a very long time to recover from it. This is one of our more, more depressing findings from the work, and I think it, but I think it's worth bringing up that, that really, at, at some point in the complex systems that we have and the, these systems that are becoming increasingly complex, um, some form of failure is inevitable. So, so some of the key characteristics that we saw for these digitally connected infrastructure, 
they're tightly coupled, so similar to a, to a domino, one small failure can, can very quickly lead to, to other failures or a chain of events which can't be stopped. They're also complex, and the, the sort of pure definition of a complex system is where the components in that system can interact in unexpected ways, and we can't necessarily anticipate how that will happen. So just to summarize some of the, some of the key points, we talked about balancing resilience with the benefits of the digital system. So to always have both sides of the both sides of the scales in mind in making decisions. It's important, I think, to recognize that many of us are dealing with existing infrastructure and legacy infrastructure and putting digital systems on top of that has advantages, but it's not going to remove the inherent vulnerabilities of that infrastructure. I think really importantly, the needs and the drivers towards digital technology need to be considered across the sectors. And we see already in terms of resilience, we see the challenge of different sectors working in silos. Um, I'd emphasized already that the, the tension between efficiency and resilience, they're not, they don't have to fight against each other, but, but we need to be aware of that potential tension and we need to think about the drivers for our decision making infrastructure systems and the resilience of infrastructure systems only so much can be done at the sector level and really there's a need for cross-sector oversight and in this particular case of how digital infrastructure is being added into these layers i think the cross-sector oversight is, is going to become increasingly important so thank you very much for listening and if you have any questions we can we can pick those up afterwards thank you Thank you for that uh, presentation. I think uh, if you have any specific questions on that, we will still take them and communicate them back to Juliet. Uh, she might even be available on the Twitter, Twitter uh, of you for responding to some of your questions. I think now we've had our presentations. Uh, of course, we also need to look at the time between now and lunch, but this is the time when the audience has got the opportunity to actually reflect back on what was presented, what was missing. I was actually thinking, you know, what are the barriers and the challenges for scaling this up? And what is really going to prevent this? Of course, some of this came from this presentation, but there are issues around that. I was also missing something on the cost effectiveness of these interventions. Where is the cost coming from, private, government? How are we are going to really look at that? But of course, I don't want to prompt these questions, open it to the audience. And I will, what we will do is uh, try to address the questions as they come so that we have a time before the, uh, before Marco tells us to stop this session uh, and move to the next sort of lunch session. So over to the audience now and uh, with your questions, please. This is a question which uh, could be addressed by almost any of the panelists, I think. Um, can, yeah. can I just request, but before the question, if you could introduce yeah, yourself, okay. sure. your organization. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Peter King uh, from the Institute for Global Environment Strategies, uh, based in Bangkok. Um, one of the key elements for both planning and for implementation and management of uh, urban resilience uh, is the lack of uh, detailed topographic information. Um, and yet it seems that governments, donors, private sector are not really interested in providing that sort of sub-meter level topographic LIDAR type uh, information which is necessary for both planning and implementation. Is there a solution to that problem? Can open it to, but anyone wants to take take this question? Looks like I'm the fall guy. <laughs> uh, uh, I think you're absolutely right. Topographic information is a, a not particularly exciting thing to invest in, but it's it's a critical to to so much of what we're trying to do. So having that high resolution information on the coastline in order to know which areas are going to be vulnerable to uh, flooding, both now and in the, in the future. 
it's a, it's a critical asset, but it's it's not an exciting one to invest in. I think the challenge is to to show how investment in such a technology can open up so many um, huge opportunities. And it's what I would call a, a completely low regret um, opportunity here. It's going to serve us now and in the future for decades to come. Okay. Uh, sort of, again, my reflection on this is that, you know, if you look across, again, uh, in this part of the region, uh, if you look across the availability of satellite imagery, look across for the availability of uh, drone mapping and all, it's actually being done in many places. How I think this is being integrated into the city planning and where the various functions, the city functionaries actually work together to implement that planning. So we have beautiful master plans being produced and never implemented. And that's the history of failed master plans around the region. Is there something around incentivizing this? But that's the next question I want to look for. Any, anyone in the audience? Maybe I have um, yes. some supplement. Um, on, about the topographic um, data or like, we, when we were doing um, the planning for the um, new town area in Hong Kong or in other East Asia cities, the first thing we do is to collect and, and then to record the topographical data. But now, um, currently, it's being kind of like more conventional way. So what we are looking for is just like the um, Singapore government, what they're doing is like the uh, virtual city. So we have a digital city. And what we are building for the Hong Kong government is like um, a, a build, build environment um, digital platform. Because like topographic data is one thing. And also the um, sea level rise or like the water level rise, the climate change, the rainwater brought by by climate change, also the environmental sewage population is issues, they are interrelated. And therefore, we build up the platform so that all the data, they are interrelated, and then all the data can pop into that platform, and we monitor the changes. So we are in the process of doing it. And um, what's more is like, because the government is putting the plan into statutory. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is, uh Francis, this is quite long. Francis Joseph de la Cruz. I'm from the Institute for Climate and Sustainable Cities, but I'm also also representing a CSO consortium on climate change. I guess my question, uh, thank you for your presentations. My question is, we're trying to build safe cities and designing them, forecasting floods, getting people involved. But in responding to this, you know, phenomenon of, you know, what we attribute to climate, how much of that is really, in your minds, how much of it is really because we have too much rain and how much of that is because we have badly planned around things that have already been happening? And my question is because I, I come from a, I, I grew up in a coastal area. We've had floods even before Kyoto. The Kyoto Protocol was signed. And we're still having floods now. And now we're, we're saying it's because of climate change. But then we're not, I don't know. Well, the people that I know who are involved in planning are not doing what they're supposed to do. So it, that's the short question I have. Thank you. That's bad planning versus climate change and the extreme weather events. Of course, there's evidence on both sides, but I'll open it to the please. I just have some reflection based on my personal experience working in a city in Canada, so a Nordic city called Edmonton. So I think uh, we planned for, we're a, very, we were a very sprawled city, and we planned for a way more population, and our drainage canals were very, very big to an extent where we are having trouble sending our sewer to the treatment plant. That's how big because everything was multiplied three times. They had the money, they were good, right? So you have that problem. But more and more, we're also noticing that the intensity of the episodes are happening. They're more frequent and there is more rain. So it's not only um, like planning and, and the percolating is something, but also the rainfall episodes have changed drastically. And that we attribute to climate change because you get flash floods now. So even with all the infrastructure we've planned, you cannot cover a flash flood. 
So uh, the intensity and the frequency have changed. And also there's some areas of the city where there's rain, but other areas don't get it. And they're like two roads apart. So I, like, I can't give you, I'm not a scientist. I can't give you an intelligent answer that is very informed on research. But I'm just saying that's one of the challenges a city is facing. So there is a percentage that has to do with bad planning. But there is something in terms of no matter how much you've planned for it, the episodes themselves are changing and not predictable. Can I give an opportunity to Rob to just react quickly before we get to the next question? Yeah, thank you very much for that cautionary remark. And I think the reality is that we have to go forward considering multiple drivers of flood risk. So yes, the, the climatic com component is expected to grow through time, but changing the surface of the city, the drainage systems, that also matters as well. And um, this is why in, in an ideal way, we're modeling these things in an integrated approach. So we're recognizing the threat from above and the threat from the ground. You need to do both. Okay, thank you, Rob. I think next question, next, any other areas that uh, the audience feels? Nothing for that side. There was a big block. I think we are almost, almost full. Yes, please. Hey everyone, good morning. I am Jay from the University of the Philippines. Um, I just want to add some information regarding that. This is not a question regarding the problems and implementation. You know, here in the Philippines, we, we have that thing we call as the comprehensive development planning. So the, the main problem in there is that uh, we here in the Philippines, are, uh, local officials are used to have those painkiller plans which means that in the, in the, um, whenever there's a problem, they will just create a certain plan for that problem. But that's when uh, the time of the comprehensive development planning comes in, wherein we would like to incorporate all different sectors. That's comprehensive land use planning, which we call CLUP. However, the problem um, starts when uh, uh, in the part of the local officials, when the, when the term ends, like Ms. Lara has been uh, presenting a while back, those uh, plans remain in the shelves. So here uh, in our university, we try to bridge the gap between the technical people and the implementer through training programs because we believe that by letting those local officials know uh, the, the things that the uh, technical people are doing, they would have a better appreciation on how to comprehensively plan for the local local play, uh, local areas. So that's just an addition. Thank you. That's interesting. Uh, Painkiller plans. That's something new that I've heard about. But anyway, I open it to the uh, panel here. So uh, very interesting. I think uh, some other South Asian countries also practice the same way. You know, uh, in, in Indonesia, we also have this, uh, you know, long-term planning, mid-planning, and, and year planning. Uh, what I want to highlight is the use of data in planning. So uh, back to my presentation on the city of Jakarta, it also, also correlates to the previous uh, questions on whether it's climate change or bad urban uh, planning or urban uh, uh, design. So uh, I think we have to use and to empower citizens to provide feedback to the government. In the city level, uh, it is the citizen, you know, who who interact on a daily basis with the with the city environment. So, if they could act as a sensor, provide data on the daily basis on whatever happened, like you know, flood, uh, damage, sewage, uh, clogging, and everything, uh, that would be very useful for. Uh, planning and budgeting for, for the following year. So what is often missing in our planning is the use of data and the data that is generated by citizen who at the end of the process will enjoy uh, the development based on the planning. So th that is my comment, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Yes, please. Good 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Sam Singson from Public Private Partnership Center. And given that I'm from PPP Center, I'm actually interested. Uh, I have a question to Sir John about Clu and its contractual arrangement with the city government of Jakarta. So, how did uh, Jakarta tap your organization? And especially that it's your, it's a private company. How are you going to recoup your investment? And how long is your cooperation period with Jakarta? Thank you very much. I think that was a really useful question because I was hinting that we need to get really into who is actually supporting this. How does public and private work? Where is the money coming from? How is it actually going to be sustained and scaled? So over to you. So uh, let me explain more about our company. So Clue is a startup technology company, and we have investors uh, that uh, you know invest in us, and uh, actually. Uh, starting this year, we claim ourselves as a profitable company. So, uh, with the city of Jakarta, we actually do a B2G partnership with them, meaning that uh, uh, we have contract with the city of Jakarta. Uh, it was started in 2015 for five years. So, our investment is on the first year because we need to build the platform. Once the platform is there, you know, it's easier for us to implement in other cities because uh, uh, the effort is not as big as is it before. Now, now, I mentioned before that we are working already with 12 other cities across Indonesia. So when we work with other cities across Indonesia, our investment, our cost is not as much as what we have before with City of Jakarta because our platform, well, our platform is already there and all we need is, you know, the same B, B2G, but with a lower cost. And we often customize the cost uh, with the budget uh, that they have, you know. Uh, because we are a startup company, we also are working on valuation. So we want to work with mayors and uh, uh, governors that is or have a very high commitment on execution, on responding to the reports from their citizen. So by doing that, Maybe in terms of you know uh, revenue is not as big as we expected, but the use of our platform is very effective and it creates uh, news and uh, more popular uh, among our users. So that's what we are doing, and so we do a B2G contract with the government, but we also have investors that invest in us, believe in what we are doing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other question? Come up with them before I give the final chance to the speakers to actually give a takeaway message, a very short takeaway message. But again, I, would, I think Lara had really provoked the audience, so I thought we would be coming back with a lot of questions. But maybe lunch between you know, just hearing the other groups uh, moving for lunch, so maybe that's not uh, sort of uh, inciting you for this. But, so, any other question before we really move to the final bit with the uh, panel that we have today. So I request uh, now uh, the panel to give us a takeaway message from this session and a very short message for the people here. What do we really do? And because I think we have the next two days, two and a half days, uh, what do you think that we should be actually stressing more uh, in the APEN conference? Over to Rob and then so I think uh, a point that I wanted to make in my talk was that we need to ensure that our technologies and plans uh, certainly reach everyone, that, and in particular the most vulnerable. So even under normal conditions uh, in the UK, the over 75-year-olds are the group that are least served by the emergency services, and that's without the stress of uh, flooding. When we impose a flood, that percentage of population that's reached drops from 80% to less than 50%. So how do we ensure that our technologies and plans reach everyone equitably, even under these extreme conditions, is a point I'd like to make. Well, I think that's a very powerful message because it actually focuses back on the poor and vulnerable, even in better off societies. Of course, what does it mean for our region where, you know, we have a lot of people still struggling with basic needs, 
of water, shelter, uh, food and energy. And that really sort of opens up a challenge. Yeah. Climate change sometimes is, you know, a concept that is far away for some people. I think we need to make it more uh, grounded and in a way that people can understand it and can participate in, in it. So I believe that citizen-generated data is very important in providing feedbacks, uh, information and data to the government where they live. So uh, the government in other side can reflect upon the feedback and create better policies to tackle problems in their cities. And I believe the communication, the interaction between citizen and government should, should be facilitated through uh, cutting edge technology that will enable that the communication uh, became real, become real time you know, and seamless. So that's the only way how cities will be uh, smart enough to tackle problems in, 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 in regards to the climate change. Okay, again, another message, I think, uh, just to reflect back on the ADB 2030 strategy now has a livable city strategy as one of the uh, priority strategies. Within that, it's actually focusing on participatory planning, something that we do less to do more of that, more of integrated solutions, working across sectors and showing that. Uh, so that's another thing. And of course, the integration of climate and disaster risk in whatever we are doing. So that's a challenge for ADB as we move ahead into our 2030 strategy. Next, please. Uh, actually, the key message already came out from um, the participant from the floor. Um, I like your question about like whether we as urban planner are doing enough to make sure that like um, the climate change uh, does not affect us. I think um, I agree with Laura that we can never plan ahead. We are, we can't forecast uh, as such. Therefore, I think um, the key message here is like um, whether the plan is resilient enough. That means um, there, whether there are solutions based for people to escape from the extreme climate when it happens. And most importantly, we all have to make sure that we are all aware the impact, the possible impact and how to react to it. Okay, that came from most of these presentations. In fact, the resilient ship presentation said you can plan to the maximum, but then how do you plan for failure? Because it's likely to happen. And how do you start planning for that? So that came out. Over to you, Lara. I would say that um, we need to be able to think out of the box and we need to have the courage, not only to plan for failure, but to embrace it. Because a lot of these innovative solutions, no one ever tried. And people are going to tell you, you will fail and you will, but you have to be very courageous in terms of saying, I failed, it's fine, we're learning. And I think the biggest hindrance right now is almost every institution does not want to fail. So, and when you fail, announce it. So. Okay, I think uh, really important, significant, again, a message for ADB and a lot of other organizations. How do you create an environment where you embrace error, where you embrace failure, and look at the institutional incentives, which actually not only reward big loans and successes around that, but also reward things that uh, are being done as short-term uh, approaches, project-based approaches, which are then going to be integrated. So, so I think that's, that's a really powerful message is coming from our uh, panel. Uh, what I have to say is just two things. Again, reflecting back on this morning, Anand Patwardhan, you heard him, the Global Commission for Adaptation, Nexus Projects, multi-sector and multiple benefits. We have to move to it. ADB has already mentioned since 2030 strategy, but it needs a Herculean effort if we really want to do it because we are still in silos and all we need to. And of course, if you introspect back into your organization, you have the same problem. So each one of us has to work across these standard barriers to working together. The second message that came from Salim ul Haq was peer-to-peer -peer learning and learning and sharing. And that's, I think, the opportunity that Apple is providing. It's actually going, talking to those people, visiting those sites, and learning how people have experimented it, done in their context, and how we can actually do it in ours. So I hope we have been able to give you a much more practical context on urban resilience, the various facets of re uh, resilience, 
especially the ecological, the physical and the infrastructure, the financial resilience, I would have had more on that. But again, I think there are other sessions there and the social and institutional resilience. So looking at this comprehensive uh, treatment of resilience and giving it a practical context. Thank you very much for being with us. We started late, but we are in time for lunch. And thanks again, a big round of applause for the panel for actually delivering this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.